Hi everyone, today we're going to be taking a look at props. Now we all know that choosing the right prop can really make all the difference to how your quad flies, how it feels in the air, but it's not an easy task. There's no one size fits all solution for the best prop. So to try and help with this, today I'm going to be taking a deep dive look at what governs the performance of props and providing some information and some recommendations to help you make good choices about what prop to use on what quad in the future. So without any further ado, let's get into it. So what governs the thrust that's generated by a prop? In general, the larger the diameter of a prop, the more thrust it's going to generate because each of its blades sweep more volume per revolution. If you add additional blades to a prop, it will increase the thrust because each blade is doing work on the air. If you have a prop with twice as many blades, it will give nearly twice as much thrust. If we look now at the actual blade shape, an aerofoil with a longer cord creates more thrust. So if your, your prop blade has a longer distance between the leading and the trailing edge, that's going to generate more thrust. A larger angle of attack up to about 16 degrees also increases thrust. And we're going to talk a lot more about angle of attack later on. The camber and shape of the aerofoil also can affect the amount of thrust that a prop generates. But these considerations are beyond the scope of this video and have a somewhat smaller part to play. What governs prop efficiency? Now a larger diameter propeller is usually more efficient due to a phenomenon called disc loading. More blades, however, reduce prop efficiency because the wake from preceding blades disturbs the flow going over subsequent blades, reducing their efficiency and their ability to generate lift. A larger angle of attack actually increases prop efficiency up to an angle of about eight degrees. So I mentioned disc loading, and disc loading is a critical parameter for the hovering efficiency of a quadcopter. A larger propeller will produce more thrust per watt. A lighter quad requires less thrust in order to hover. And the combination of these two factors mean that you get an increase in efficiency with lighter disc loading. So that is a light aircraft with large props. And we can see that here on this graph with a helicopter having the best efficiency and also the lowest disc loading, and uh, something like a jump jet having the lowest efficiency and the highest disc loading. Angle of attack has a really important effect on both thrust and efficiency of a prop. As you begin to increase the angle of attack of an aerofoil, it starts to generate more lift, and you can see that on the red line on this graph. Drag also increases this orange line and the graph here shows an example of the relationship between lift and drag, the L over D ratio, and you can see that peaks at this point here. The exact shapes of these curves depend on the shape of the aerofoil and they're quite hard to determine without doing kind of complex fluidic simulation or, uh, or experimental testing. When you reach approximately 16 degrees, again this does depend on the shape of the aerofoil, you find that this relationship starts to break down and the aerofoil stalls. A stall occurs when the airflow over the aerofoil can no longer remain attached to its top surface. The way that aerofoils generate lift creates an adverse pressure gradient of low pressure at the leading edge of the wing and high pressure at the trailing edge of the wing. And so as the airflow moves over that top surface, it's trying to run uphill and eventually it no longer has the momentum to do that and a flow separation occurs. And this flow separation starts at the trailing edge and propagates forward rapidly with increasing angle of attack. And once the aerofoil has stalled, its behavior changes in a number of really important ways. It generates a lot less lift. It generates a lot more drag and both the lift and the drag become unsteady in time, which can create vibrations and buffeting and visible um, oscillations in your, your video, visible blurriness. This is clearly bad news and we want to avoid it happening to our props. And we can do that by considering their angle of attack. 
So here there's an image of a propeller that's stalled and you can see that there are these turbulent recirculation regions on the top of the aerofoil and this is creating a lot of turbulent air and is generating a lot of drag and also affecting that aerofoil's ability to generate lift. So how can we calculate the angle of attack for the props on our quadcopters? The angle of attack is related to the pitch and the radius of the prop, the RPM of the motor and the inflow velocity. And we can calculate the effective angle of attack, the AOA, with this equation. This is the fixed pitch of the prop. This is an angle of attack modifying term to do with the relative movement of the air compared to the movement of the prop. And it's the arc tangent of V inflow, which is the axial velocity of the air relative to the propeller, divided by the tip speed of the propeller, omega r. And we can see that increasing the RPM has the effect of increasing the angle of attack, and increasing the inflow velocity reduces the angle of attack. And that's because of this angle of attack modifying term here getting bigger and smaller as we change those two parameters. So how can we calculate the fixed angle of attack of a particular prop given the pitch and diameter, which is commonly how props are specified? Well, we can take the pitch and divide it by pi times the diameter. If we take the arc tangent of that, we get the fixed pitch of the prop in degrees. And this is for the prop tip. What we'll find is that closer to the hub, the angle of attack on the prop will be greater and this is because the tangential velocity of the blade is slower closer to the hub than it is at the tip. And I've done this calculation for a few props of different, uh, different dimensions, different pitches, and what we find is that the pitch of our props varies from about 13 degrees for a 50-37 up to as much as 18 degrees for something like a 50-51. And if you remember that we said that aerofoil stall at about 16 degrees of angle of attack, you could be forgiven for thinking that the 5051 is just going to be stalled in a hover. But that doesn't take into account inflow velocity. Inflow velocity, as we said, is the axial speed of the air moving past the prop. And we can estimate this by considering a force balance of the force required to keep the quad in a hover compared to the change in momentum of the air that's created by the props that's holding it in that hover. So the force required to keep the quad in a hover is the mass of the quad times gravitational acceleration and the change in momentum of the airflow created by the four props is 4 times the volume of air which is pi r squared times v inflow times the density of the air and then times V inflow to give you momentum. And if we rearrange that, we find that a good estimate of, in, of V inflow uh, might be something like a half the square root of the mass of the quad times gravitational acceleration divided by the density of the air times the area of the prop. If we use this previous equation for a five inch quad weighing 600 grams, we get an inflow velocity of approximately 10 meters a second. If we combine that with an assumption of about 12,000 RPM for a hover, that gives us a tangential velocity at the tip of 80 meters a second and an angle of attack modifying term here, this arc tan V inflow over tip speed of approximately seven degrees. So we can see that there's a really significant reduction in angle of attack due to inflow velocity in this case. If you imagine that 5051 has an angle of attack of 18 degrees, when we take V inflow into account, that drops to only 11 degrees. And it's important to remember that this angle of attack adjustment will increase with the disc loading of our propeller. Let's talk now about adverse inflow conditions, or as uh, us freestyle pilots like to call it, flying. In good inflow conditions, the angle of attack of the blade is constant as it rotates. So 
the air is moving axially straight down and the angle of attack is constant on the blade as it rotates around. If we're in a side slip scenario, the angle of attack of the blade actually changes as it rotates. And that can cause problems because that means that the lift that the blade is generating is different for different points in the rotation. In a reversed inflow situation, the actual angle of attack of the blade may end up being more than the fixed angle of attack. And that can make it much more likely that a, a blade will stall. Handling all of these conditions ends up being easier for a blade with a lower fixed pitch because there's much less likelihood of it ever reaching a stall condition. In reverse flow conditions, a higher RPM also helps reduce the angle of attack. So RPM is an interesting one because in normal inflow, high RPM increases the angle of attack, but in reversed inflow condition, the R higher RPM reduces the angle of attack. Another important consideration is the maximum suitable tip speed for a prop. In many cases, we might require really high RPMs to achieve sufficient thrust at high speeds, particularly with um, props with a small fixed pitch. Prop efficiency is degraded by air compressibility effects above a tip speed of about 0.62 Mach, which equates to about 32,000 RPM for a 5 inch prop. Now the absolute max RPM that we should ever consider running a prop at is that which gives a tip speed of between 0.8 and 0.92 Mach. Now if we go above that, what will happen is we'll start getting supersonic flow over certain parts of our prop. And that will create an enormous amount of drag, an enormous amount of noise and vibration and will very quickly make the quad completely unflyable. This maximum tip speed is most relevant for pilots who are running pretty low pitch props with very high KV motors. For example, more than 2000 KV on 6S. That actually gives them the potential to achieve RPMs and tip speeds that exceed this 0.62 Mach number and even get into the region of 0.8 to 0.92 Mach. There's a really great prop tip speed calculator at Warp Drive Props. I'll put this link down in the video description. And what it shows is that once you get above about 42,000 RPM for a 5 inch, you start running the risk of getting transonic flow across your prop. So now that we've talked about all these different parameters that influence how our props behave, can we distill that down into some recommendations? So we'll start with freestyle. Freestyle pilots typically want maximum control in reverse flow or prop wash situations as that a lot of freestyle tricks involve reverse flow, like a split S for example. In order to have this maximum control, freestyle pilots should prefer very low pitch props. 5043s, 5040s, 5037s and even 5031s. And that's because these props are not going to stall their blades even in extreme reverse inflow conditions. And if they don't stall, that means they're going to give a much more predictable um, amount of thrust, much less vibration, um, much less jello in your camera, that sort of thing. If we're taking very low pitch props, our top end thrust has to be achieved through high RPMs. So we have to pair these lower pitch props with a higher KV motor in order to provide that top end thrust. Now, this setup is less efficient because it operates at a low angle of attack. And you remember that we said that uh, increasing the angle of attack, as long as we don't exceed 16 degrees, increasing the angle of attack actually increases efficiency. So the trade-off for running very low pitch props is quite a low efficiency. What if we talk about technical racing pilots? Now these pilots may be less concerned with having perfect stability in reverse flow situations. And they might benefit from a bit more pitch because they might want that extra efficiency. Avoiding blade stall is still really important because we want these pilots to still have control in tight corners. And so I would suggest moderate pitches such as 5043, 5045 and 5047 might be most appropriate for racers who are racing tighter tracks. 
The higher pitch should also provide more efficiency, which allows for higher thrust for the same power. So that could give a, a speed advantage and an acceleration advantage um, for, for a quadcopter. KV here will need to be selected to avoid overloading the batteries. So you're going to need slightly lower KV than what you would have for uh, a very, very light pitch prop like a 5040 or lower. I have another video that's looking at um, selecting KV for different props. And I'll link that in the video description, but that talks about how to find the right KV for a particular prop. And what about long range? and open racing where you've not got many sharp corners you've got a lot of long straights and speed is uh, more of a concern to you in these situations where reverse flow is really unlikely and particularly in situations where inflow velocity is always relatively high for example you're always um, in relatively fast forward flight maximum efficiency and thrust will be achieved with a higher pitch prop something like a 5047, a 5050 or a 5051. Now these steep pitched props must be paired with low KV motors and potentially also a throttle limit because if you if you push the throttle too hard on these very steeply pitched props you'll lose all the efficiency gains of the higher angle of attack simply by having the high current draw of uh, a high pitched prop. Whenever you're considering the pitch of your prop, always consider this angle of attack adjustment factor due to disc loading. A long range quad with a lighter disc loading will want slightly lower pitch props. A heavier racing frame or a heavier top speed focused quad will want even steeper props because of its relatively high disc loading. So just bear that in mind, take that into account. I hope that you found this video interesting and that the information here will help you pick the right prop for the quads that you fly and how you like to fly them. If you have any comments or questions, or if you just want some clarification about some of the stuff that I talk about in this video, please leave a comment down below. There are no bad questions, only bad answers. And I promise to try and give you good answers to all your questions if I possibly can. Next time, I'm going to be doing a vibration and resonance analysis of the FPV cycle glide frame or the Hyperlight glide frame. I know Bob Rugi is super excited to see how it performs. I hope you are too. If you don't want to miss that and the other videos that I'm going to be coming out with, please make sure you're subscribed. If you think that this work really has value for you and you would like to support this channel, um, please consider taking a look at my Patreon. I'll put a link for that down in the video description. That's all I have for you for now. So until next time, I wish you all very happy flying.